Hello, I'm Naomi Paxton. I'm really delighted to be talking to you as part of this online TAPRA event. My talk is entitled, My Immense But Coordinated Octopus Teacher, an ECR in COVID times takes inspiration from the AFL during World War I. Uh, so this is a sort of mixed talk. I want to talk a little bit about uh, revisiting research um, and also talk a little bit about the strangeness of the past 18 months. I was fortunate enough to be given the TAPRA ECR Research Prize in 2019 for my body of work on suffrage theatre, which has mostly been around public engagement around suffrage theatre and entertainments and really um, bringing the story of the Actresses Franchise League, which is the, the organisation I did most of my research, my doctorate on, um, to new and different audiences and to new and different collaborators. So I've sort of got three lives. If you've read my bio, you might see that. Um, so I have a part-time academic job. Um, I'm Knowledge Exchange Fellow at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama, University of London. Um, so I am um, publishing and, and uh, you know, become involved in, in academic work in that format. I also am a freelance sort of public engagement professional. I'm a presenter and a broadcaster and um, an MC. And then in the other part of my life, which I won't be really talking about today, I'm a professional cabaret performer, comedy um, performer and magician. And I do that as a, a character called Ada Camp. So um, the COVID times has affected all three of those things, my academic work, um, my public engagement freelance work and my performance work. And it's been a really interesting time as it has been for all of us. So I want to talk about the Actresses Franchise League during World War One, but I need to introduce them to you first. So uh, for those of you who don't know anything about the Actresses Franchise League, a quick run through. So the Actresses Franchise League was founded in November 1908 by theatre professionals who wanted to support the Votes for Women cause through their work. The Actresses Franchise League facilitated the participation of a wide range of theatre makers and performers, and membership was open to any woman who was or had been in the theatrical professions, including dancers, musicians and variety performers, as well as backstage staff. By 1914, the Actresses Franchise League had nearly a thousand female members from the UK, Europe, Russia, Australia and America. It had also established an affiliated men's group and gained the support of over 100 influential patrons outside of the theatre industry. For ambitious and politically aware performers, the Actresses Franchise League and its sister society, the Women Writers Suffrage League, provided the chance to form close working alliances and friendships, develop influential industry networks, and be part of the production of new female-led feminist and suffragist writing for the stage. It was a confident and capable organisation. It had created opportunities for supportive women and men across the performing arts to be visible as activists in and out of the industry and to bring and represent their activist experiences to the stage and to work with both constitutional and militant societies. The League was a strictly neutral in regard to tactics, which meant that they worked with everybody, both militant societies and constitutional societies. And for me as a researcher, that's been really interesting because I haven't just looked at one part of the suffrage movement, you know, just the suffragettes, but just the suffragists, because the Actresses Franchise League and the Women Writers Suffrage League worked with everybody. It's been um, in the UK and in other countries, it's been a really interesting experience to research that more widely. Suffrage theatre, entertainments and performances were predominantly produced in the UK between 1907 and 1917 and the range of performative propaganda is enormous. It's just a joy to research. It includes uh, one-act comedies, four-act melodramas, uh, modern dance, ballet, folk dance, music hall sketches, puppetry, magic, embodied activist gestures, site-specific performances, immersive role-playing environments, verbatim style pieces and silent films. The Actresses Franchise League made one in 1911. They were performed in all sorts of venues, not only traditional theatre spaces, but also restaurants, roller skating rinks, open air spaces, public halls, fairs, fates and bazaars. In 1913, the AFL founded the Women's Theatre Project, designed to open up opportunities for women to be part of the business of theatre and to participate every level on and off stage. Um, for this project, which ran very successfully in 1913 at the Coronet Theatre in Notting Hill, um, men were allowed to be part of, you know, the actors, they were allowed to be part of the cast and to write plays. But the whole point was really to create a sort of alternative old girls network 
um, and give women opportunities in business and management in, in running venues um, and in creating female centered work for the stage that uh, represented underrepresented voices and stories on stage. So after that very successful first season, the, there were plans for the second season to go ahead. Um, but after the outbreak of the First World War, that sort of changed everything. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But League members threw themselves into war work. They founded the Women's Emergency Corps, the British Women's Hospital Fund. They administered the Era War Distress Fund and the Three Arts Employment Fund. Um, the Women's Theatre became the Women's Theatre Camps Entertainments. They took variety shows um, by suffragist playwrights to army camps in the UK and abroad and th by three years. So by 1917, they'd given over well over a thousand performances in clubs and huts and hospitals and camps. They employed hundreds of artists. Um, playwright and novelist Elizabeth Robbins said, quote, not for this was the Women's Theatre founded, but the Women's Theatre has taken up with energy and marked success its, its rightful share in war service, end quote. And members of the Actresses Franchise League were also hugely involved in other parts of the war effort. Cicely Hamilton, who was a playwright and an actress, helped to found the Scottish Women's Hospitals in France. And uh, Lena Ashwell organised YMCA concert parties that entertained troops at the front. In London, AFL members were also performing regularly, including at the YMCA's Shakespeare Hut, which was the hut for Anzac soldiers in Bloomsbury. On the, on the land that the Shakespeare um, Theatre Memorial Committee had bought, and at the Endell Street Hospital, which was run entirely um, by suffragists and suffragette women. The British Women's Hospital Fund was formed in January 1915 and based at the AFL's offices. In fact, it was run by a subcommittee of the League that was only open to AFL members, and the purpose of the fund was to refurbish the Star and Garter Hotel in Richmond and turn it into a respite home for disabled soldiers and sailors that could then be given to the Red Cross. I am in no way comparing myself as an ECR um, and as a human uh, with an entire organisation. Um, neither am I comparing COVID times with World War One. but what I think has been interesting um, when I've been revisiting this work, particularly because archives and libraries have been closed, has been um, just looking at the complete derailment of, of where somebody or a, a group of people thought that they were going. And also the sort of collapse really of the theatre industry and the, the reconfiguring um, of, of the formal theatre industry in this period and, and exactly the kind of struggles that we've been experiencing in the arts, uh, across the arts actually, as well as many other industries this year and this past 18 months. I want to uh, talk about this octopus. Now I've, octopuses have eight tentacles as we know, uh, an immense but coordinated octopus was a description that a visitor made um, when going to the Women's Emergency Corps rooms in Bedford Street. The Women's Emergency Corps was pretty much the first wartime organisation founded by the Actresses Franchise League. It was initially founded at the Little Theatre um, in um, Robert Street or Adam Street, just behind the Strand. The Little Theatre was run by actress manager Gertrude Kingston. It had opened in 1910 with a production of Lysistrata, uh, commissioned by Kingston. Um, uh, Lawrence Houseman had written it with a kind of distinctly suffrage flavour and it was just across the road from the Actresses Franchise League offices. And when I was thinking about the Women's Emergency Corps, I was uh, thinking about the, the way that the actresses who started and ran that project absolutely diversified their portfolio and moved forward or sometimes sideways and then forward with confidence. So uh, we're going to focus on eight tentacles that I think um, for me come out of the Women's Emergency Call story but also speak to my story um, going forward and sometimes sideways as an ECR particularly over the past 18 months. So the tentacles are in no particular order, you can read them in every way you wish, I'm going to read them clockwise and you can see them now. Be kind, collaborate, can't move forwards, move sideways, trademark, ask for help, be elastic, look for the gaps, and be useful. Let's start with the first one. Now, I went into central London to record um, some stops on my usual Actresses Franchise League West End walk. As I did that um, in the West End, there was a lot, there's a huge police presence on the streets, not because I was doing my walk, um, and a, a helicopter that was circling Covent Garden 
I don't know if it was looking for naughty people or protecting important people, um, but I have had to really cut down a lot of the things I filmed because there was very obvious and very loud helicopter noises in the background. I'm going to include a few of them here, the ones that are least helicoptery, but please be warned they are still very helicoptery, but I think there will be subtitles on this talk, so that's fine. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about, I think, is um, look for the gaps. And it's a story from when I first started doing my Actresses Franchise League walks and really first started thinking about public engagement. So I'm just outside the Theatre Royal Drury Lane on Catherine Street in Covent Garden and just behind me is a restaurant called The Garden which is actually on the site of a vegetarian restaurant in Edwardian London called The Gardenia where suffrage plays and suffrage meetings were held. In 2012, I think probably 2012 or 2013, I think 2012, uh, I was in the second year of my PhD research um, and I was absolutely immersed in it, as you can imagine. And I gave my first ever Actresses Franchise League West End Walk. I brought people along with me and uh, we started at Charing Cross, we've been all the way along the Strand and then we were here. And as we were standing here, I mentioned obviously that the Gardini was there, but I really wanted to talk about the Theatre or Drury Lane and about a meeting that had happened in 1913. And I went into oh, such detail about it, who was on stage, the kind of things they were talking about, why it was important and why it had really fired me up. And um, at the end of the walk, we got to a pub around the corner and I was kind of asking for feedback from people who'd been on the walk. And one of the first things they said about the entire walk wasn't, gosh, the actress franchise league were brilliant, or why didn't we know more about this? Pretty much the first thing they said was, gosh, I didn't realise there were vegetarian restaurants in London in that period. And I just, my heart sank a little bit and I went, but that what? All of that, all of that information and the, the thing that had stuck was the fact that they were vegetarian restaurants and it was a really important lesson for me in public engagement and in terms of coming out of my research and, and finding the hooks again in my research that first got me there, uh, sort of putting myself out of that sort of deep well that I was in and kind of reconnecting with the human stories. Um, and very quickly I learned to say there were three big crazes in Edwardian London, jiu-jitsu, roller skating and vegetarianism and the suffragettes were all over them. And then I had three hooks that were about social history and cultural history and human lives. And then, once I'd hooked people into that story, uh, then I could begin to then talk about suffrage activism and suffrage theatre. But it was an important lesson to learn and I'm very grateful that I learned it here. So those hooks have actually been really interesting. The vegetarianism hook has been fascinating in terms of opening conversations about um, anti-vivisection campaigning in this period. Um, the jujitsu hook has been fascinating. That's been a really good one. Um, talked about that on the radio, helps people with books about that. And in fact, during lockdown, a French comic book company got in touch with me because they weren't able to access archives at the British Library because everything was closed, asking if I had information and I did. And uh, in return, I got these beautiful shiny French uh, comic book about the jiu-jitsu suffragettes in, in Edwardian London, which is very exciting. Um, roller skating is another one. Now, I'm not a roller skater, but I do have a story about that. Here's a clip. So we're here, the Novello Theatre is the first theatre I ever did an Actresses Franchise League reading in, in 2007 when I was there, actually 2008, when I was there in a play called Shadowlands. We're also here because this lamppost was my, uh, my rock in 2013 when we did the first ever um, living literature walk called Stage Rights with Scary Little Girls. We commissioned a playwright to write a piece based on the newspaper reports and the testimonies of um, activists and journalists who'd been in the Aldwych Rinkeries, a roller skating rink, during the 1911 census boycott and witnessed the Actresses Franchise League performing there. Um, so yeah, we commissioned a monologue um, about that and it was the most fantastic thing. It was a woman who just emerged from the rink at 5am and she was absolutely exhilarated and just felt visible and confident and optimistic and everything. Um, and she was on roller skates. And the day before the first performance, one of our actors wasn't able to do it. And so I had to step in. I don't roller skate. And so I spent about six hours that day clinging to this lamppost, um, launching myself at audience members as they came around the corner, they're coming back and doing this monologue and just shouting out about votes for women. So there we go. When we did the uh, Stage Rights Living Literature Walk again in 2016, we hired a performer that could, uh, could roller skate for that section. Um, so the infrastructures of the Campaign for Women's Suffrage provided an ideal framework for the organisation of the work that they did during World War One. They, they kind of in, it kind of enabled them to maximise both range and political impact. They already had 
you know, they already had an awareness of how to talk to the press, how to be visible in public space, how to campaign, how to find different language to speak to different groups, um, how to reach out in different ways, how to appeal visually. Um, and the Women's Emergency Corps was founded by members of the Actresses Franchise League just two days after the outbreak of World War One, and quote, devised to be elastic, unhampered by political or social prejudices, and prepared to undertake any work that should be useful, whatever that work might prove to be. So we've got two of our tentacles in this. Uh, we've got be elastic and be useful. So four days after the Women's Emergency Corps Foundation, 2,000 women had volunteered. And three weeks later, um, it was reported in the press that their card index files had the names of 15,000 women. So some who were volunteers and some who, so some who could afford to be volunteers and some who needed the work and were being paid to do that work. So the Women's Emergency Corps held regular and uh, free public meetings in theatres and venues across the UK to fundraise and update supporters. And by January 1915, so less than a year, the organisation had 15 branches across England and Wales and 18 departments, including clerical work, housecraft, interpreting, land development, medical and nursing, the National Food Fund, needlework, toy industry and the Women's Volunteer Corps. So the organisation provided interpreters as part of a large network of women's groups and societies helping Belgian refugees arriving at London stations to find accommodation, work, medical treatment, legal advice, clothing. Um, the Corps organised the teaching of French and German in over 40 military centres outside London and published two booklets of French and German phrases subtitled The Soldier's First Aid to Foreign Languages for English Soldiers Abroad. They, um, they created these amazing toy factories, developing original designs um, through high profile collaborations and registering a trademark, trademark under the tentacle there, um, and doing all kinds of good stuff. So toy making um, and the toy industry was really a fertile for women workers in this period partly because German toys were no longer being imported um, due to the war. And the Women's Emergency Corps were just one of the organisations, um, Sylvia Pankhurst's East London Federation of Suffragettes is one of the others, um, that started a toy industry and toy factories. And the, um, the Women's Emergency Corps' trademark was the lion's claw, you can see that here, um, and that was on all their toys and they made an extraordinarily diverse range of toys. They had dolls, they had wooden toys, they collaborated um, with a designer called William Wildman to create caricatures of famous figures. They collaborated with the curator of the Tower Armories to create a model of Henry VIII astride a white horse for a, a series called Soldiers Ancient and Modern. Um, they sold their toys at the Army and Navy stores, in Selfridges, in Harrods, they sold them abroad. Um, and we know that there were certain members of the AFL who were involved in this. Edith Craig, the daughter of Ellen Terry, uh, seems to have designed a Piero on springs, a mermaid, and something called Picky G, quote, an indescribable and glorious beast made of stockingette, end quote, apparently with eyes that followed you around the room. Um, while Pamela Coleman Smithy, who um, some of you may know, um, created Pamela's playthings. One was a cottage in a box with a removable roof, garden path, flower pots and bay trees. And you see some of the ones here, really interesting examples of sort of realistic style trenches, um, as well as apparently a very realistic penguin called Simon. You can see the diagram here of Simon the penguin. And then when we actually see Simon the penguin with Lena Ashwell in this publicity shot, you'll see the diagram is pretty accurate. So Simon the penguin was part of this as well. Um, in March 1915, the Women's Emergency Corps exhibited their toys at the British Industries Fair held at the Agricultural Hall, Hall in London. When I first read about the Women's Emergency Corps toy factories, I immediately, of course, dashed to uh, research about toys in the early 20th century, to toys in the First World War, uh, toys of the Edwardian period, and didn't find anything about them. In fact, I couldn't find their trademark at all. And I was very fortunate to find a scrapbook documenting pretty much the entire work of the Women's Emergency Corps toy factories and all the press clippings. I found this in at the V&A Museum of Childhood. Um, but actually, this scrapbook and the work of the Women's Emergency Corps toy factories has not been included in any histories of British toy making in this period. So it took me a long time to track down the trademark the lion's claw. In fact, I during lockdown, 
um, I had a signet ring made with the lion's claw on it, just as a little reminder to be elastic and useful and versatile and all the things on this octopus. Um, so despite the fact they had a trademark, a registered trademark, uh, there appear to be no toys made by the Women's Emergency Corps in any collections, certainly that I found as yet, although I do sort of take it around with me as a photo to um, show any antique shops. But I think in terms of an ECR spin and something I've really learned um, since, you know, I, I graduated in 2015 and also particularly over the past 18 months is really to uh, make sure that you as an ECR uh, trademark your own work or have something to take with you. I think often we go from uh, sort of postdoc short term part time contracts or just short term contracts as a postdoc you work on other people's projects or you work as a research associate or research assistant on other people's projects and then you leave and you don't have much of your own to show for it and at the meantime you're scrabbling to apply for funding and you're scrabbling to publish and teach and do all sorts of things and get all kinds of work and actually it's really important that you keep something for yourself but also that you document what you're doing and I do that particularly over social media um, I think it's important for me uh, to share that work on social media to be visible. It helps me get other future work. It's important for me to talk about it, to package it, to pitch it, um, to really make sure that what you're doing uh, has value and uh, can be sort of traced back to you where appropriate. Not to jump on somebody else's work if needs be, but the things that you have done can be traced back to you and that you can use them. Uh, it's, I think it's quite hard to establish visibility as a researcher, particularly if you're trying to go for ALTAC or um, sort of academic careers plus, or you're working part time in academic careers and you're also trying to work part time as a freelancer. Um, it's important really to to know to be yourself on purpose, but also to claim what you do um, and to be able to move forward with that work, even when you've left a project. So, yes, that's what I wanted to say about this trademark part. I want to talk about two more of the arms. So um, can't move forward, move sideways and ask for help. So one of the things that I ended up doing um, in lockdown, so the first time sort of from June 2020 was starting an online suffrage play reading group with a lot of my friends who are performers in, across all sorts of bits of the industry, um, but were not working. And that was something that I've often held or quite often held suffrage play reading groups, either getting people all over to uh, wherever I'm living at the time or meeting people in central London and organising play readings. But I often then tend to use my sort of hero plays or the I suppose heroine plays um, or the plays that I know are going to work because I don't want those performers to lose confidence in me. And I also want them to have an entertain entertaining experience that I suppose ticks some of the boxes they think they're coming to take uh, tick when they come and take part in a play uh, suffrage play reading but what the online project did was sort of um, give me the opportunity to share some of the quirkier um, plays I've, I've come across in my research plays that I've never done readings of before and never heard before plays that I'm not immensely confident in um, plays where that whole subjective opinion of is it good or not actually the only way to find out is by reading it by bringing it off the page and and um, there were a lot of performers who were just very happy to sight read um, with that with low stakes um, to be kind of cast in a, in a way that they weren't having to be cast for self tapes um, to be playful and to really want to discuss this work. And so we've uh, had had, I think, 29 sessions uh, at this time of recording. It's gone on for well over a year and we've drawn in academics and performers um, from America and from Australia and from the UK and from Europe. And we've read two or three plays, kind of short plays or one long play, maybe across two sessions. And then we've discussed it. And it's been a really fascinating process. And some of the plays that I felt less confident in, um, for example, a play where everybody is a parrot, um, turned out to be absolutely fascinating and really moved people. Um, or some plays that were more immersive or plays that were uh, designed to be pop-up performances, sort of kind of flash mob style immersive performances the audience weren't aware of those things came off really well in in um, in readings as well and and that was phenomenal I kind of felt that I couldn't really ask other performers to help me but I suppose because even though they weren't being paid none of us were being paid and I wasn't selling this work although if you would like to join the um 
snappily titled Suffrage Plays Reading Group on Facebook, you'll be able to see all the videos of all the readings that we've done and listen to the discussions too, and participate in future readings if you'd like to. It's been a wonderful opportunity to collaborate and really listen to those performers and hear their reflections on that work. Um, and to hear the academics who voluntarily come to hear plays that are very rarely performed or even spoken. And that's been a wonderful part of it. So I felt quite vulnerable, I suppose, as a researcher asking for help in that way. Please, will you come and read? Or please, can you meet me online and let's read this play? I don't know if it'll be any good. I don't necessarily have the most shiny part for you, um, but please come and read it and see what happens. And I'll trust in your instinct as a performer um, and your skill as a performer and your willingness to share um, that space uh, and to, to kind of meet new people to create something wonderful and that's been phenomenal I don't still don't know what I'm going to do with it I kind of worried about that for a while I thought what am I going to make of this but actually it doesn't matter at the moment we're just exploring we're reading plays we're well into the read up to I think 30 something plays and then we had a Christmas special where we read some poems um, together and and move that that work into a different space and again share it with different audiences and particularly performers particularly from my cabaret and comedy worlds um that i probably or probably wouldn't respond to a call out or wouldn't be free to respond to a physical call out to come and meet for a reading have been able to join online and again that just moves that work and moves those ideas into a different space i never really got involved in this work because i was interested in the suffrage movement per se i was interested in activism in theater and um, underrepresented voices and kind of that, that systemic inequality um, around particularly the things that have suppressed women's participation um, and ongoing financial um, uh, success and the cultural legacy of that work and the impact of that work and why so much of this extraordinary work from the Edwardian period, particularly around this one issue, this political theatre, hasn't really, um, it's beginning to now, and it, it did when it was revived in the 80s, but hasn't really made it into the mainstream about the history of political theatre in this country on the importance of, of women's voices in this period on stage and particularly of new work. The Actresses Franchise League were really interesting in that they didn't do all female Shakespeare and they didn't do all female classics. They made new work and they wrote and produced and commissioned work across a variety of genres for a variety of different audiences that absolutely captured their own experiences of activism, the voices they were hearing on the streets. Elizabeth Robbins' 1907 play, um, for which became Votes for Women, was commissioned by Gertrude Kingston of the Little Theatre again. Um, and Robbins wasn't a suffragist before she wrote it, but spending time on the road with suffrage campaigners and really hearing the arguments turned her into a suffragist. And that was the same for so many other people in the theatre industry and you know, in the, in the wider world. So I think ask for help and uh, can't move forwards, move sideways. I don't know what I'm gonna do with that, but I know that it's happened. I know that it's been a sharing of work and I know that it's been a regaining of confidence um, for people not only doing sight reading and performing um, and collaborating with other performers when they haven't been able to meet them physically, but also to learn a little bit more about that period as well. So that has been an interesting part of my journey as an ECR and somebody who hasn't wanted to follow a traditional academic path is really to diversify and to work across disciplines and to work with different collaborators, be they artists, uh, musicians, performers, uh, writers, heritage, museum professionals, curators, um, political scientists, all sorts of people. Uh, so this part of, at past 18 months, I've been able to work um, with a designer and uh, with an organization called Green and Women Everywhere. We're creating a new collaborative board game celebrating uh, the anniversary of the Green and Common, of founding the Green and Common protest. Um, I've also worked uh, with Scary Little Girls, who have developed a number of living literature walks with, to create an online Salon de la Vie series all about the research themed around different parts and different plays. And we've worked with the actors that I did the readings with to uh, create content for those salons. Um, and that's been a different way of kind of embracing that research and pairing it with ideas for cocktails and songs um, and kind of drawing that into the 21st century and into the conversations that we're having right now about where we are and about who's represented the theatre and how we relate um, to the society around us and what needs to happen next. The Women's Emergency Corps were among many women's organisations in, in World War One, or organisations run predominantly by women in World War One, who um, felt that their contribution was not really being recognised um, by those in power. 
Lena Ashwell remembered that, quote, weekly lists were sent to the war office containing full particulars as to the numbers of women we could supply for transport, cooks, interpreters and so forth. And each week a letter was received in acknowledgement saying that women were not needed, end quote. The Women's Emergency Corps saw this as ludicrous and shameful, noting that the Home Secretary had refused the services of women interpreters and the offer of, quote, 25 women motorcyclists able to repair their own and other people's machines has been similarly neglected. And how about the post office work, the ticket selling, the express message carrying and other useful and necessary employments that are now suspended or working short? Women could carry them on just as well as men while men are in the field. But no women need apply has been this narrow-minded government's rule, whether for votes or anything else. Despite the fact that they were so involved in the war effort and in founding and running organisations, as well as carrying on their own freelance theatre work or to least attempting to, the Actors Franchise League and other suffragist organisations continue campaigning for the vote. Uh, before 1914, only 58% of men had the vote. And by 1916, it became clear that the next general election could not use the pre-war electoral register as many men on military service had been out of the country too long to meet the residency qualifications. There was also a strong feeling amongst politicians on all sides that previously unenfranchised men who had been conscripted into the forces or otherwise contributed to the war effort deserved the vote. So a cross-party conference of 32 MPs and peers was formed to discuss electoral reform. Um, it was known as the Speaker's Conference because Speaker Lowther was chairman. And women suffrage campaigners saw their opportunity and lobbied politicians extensively. And in January 1917, the conference recommended that an age limit of 30 or 35 be set and left the House of Commons to debate, which um, if we need to go into another lockdown again over Christmas, then I, I, Hansard is a fascinating, the Hansard debates around this are a really fascinating period. Two months later, over 80 women representing 33 suffrage societies and women's organisations took part in a deputation to the Prime Minister, who was then Lloyd George. And among those uh, women was um, Gertrude Elliott, who was the president of the Actresses Franchise League, they were led by Millicent Garrett Fawcett, whose statue now stands in Parliament Square. But they also included Emmeline Pankhurst, uh, Charlotte Despard, Eleanor Rathbone, and Dr. Louisa Garrett Anderson. And they were campaigning, really, going to Lloyd George um, to ask his advice, saying that they wanted the vote for all women. And we have the deputation document, it's in the parliamentary archives. Um, Millicent Garrett Fawcett does say, however, we should greatly prefer an imperfect scheme that can pass to the most perfect scheme in the world that could not pass. And they were concerned about the age bar that was recommended. Lloyd George said to them, quote, I know it is illogical. I know it is unjustifiable to limit it. I strongly urge you, however unpalatable it may be and however undesirable from the point of view of excluding a very, very considerable number of women who have rendered great service in this war. I strongly urge you to stand by this proposal and say that this will satisfy you. So he advised the deputation not to challenge the recommendations made by the Speaker's Conference, um, basically warning that if calls were made for votes of women on the same terms as men, that there was likely to be strong um, opposition from anti-suffragist MPs. And if you look in Hansard, you can absolutely see that. Um, there's a, a real kind of hypocritical flavour to the anti-suffragist um, uh, MPs um, speaking and peers speaking. Um, that men who've uh, been part of the war effort deserve the vote, but the women who've been part of the war effort don't. And this all has to do with kind of numbers and fear that women would vote en masse as a bloc. But I think it's interesting that the campaigning carried on and that unlike many of the things that we've often heard about the suffragettes, that they only wanted the vote for some women, that actually this was a kind of united front from the suffrage societies and from women workers and representatives of women workers and, um, and, and unions saying that they wanted the vote for all women on the same terms as men. But it was the Prime Minister who recommended that they um, be satisfied with the little bit that they might be offered if they didn't protest too much. So when the um, franchise, when that, when that act was passed in February 1918, there were sort of muted celebrations really amongst suffrage campaigners. Obviously, the Actors Franchise League continued campaigning. An Actresses Franchise League meeting with the theme The Artist's Place in Reconstruction was held at the St James's Theatre in June 1918. May Whitty, who chaired the meeting, said, quote, On account of the war, they had lost touch with members and friends, but they had all been trying to do their bit, 
and the League's bit had been pretty extensive. They had not lost sight of the fact that the League was a suffrage society, first and foremost. They were very much alive and kicking, as of old, against injustice and inequality and trying to better conditions." End quote. So during the years between the outbreak of the First World War and then the passing of the Equal Franchise Bill in 1928, the Actresses Franchise League opened up new opportunities for actresses to be involved in political and feminist activism and extended its work as an organisation across a diverse portfolio of social, political and philanthropic projects. So they just tried new ventures and they were not afraid to work hard to develop them and to respond to the challenges of war by utilising and trusting the strengths, instincts and experiences of their membership and their experiences of campaigning. So 1914 had begun with the hope for a very successful season of the women's, second season of the women's theatre and a commitment to the continuation of suffrage campaigning. Um, but despite the halting of that production, um, in that year, the, the Women's Theatre, the Women's Theatre Camps Entertainment sustained that feminist and suffragist presence in the industry, created space and visibility on stage and off during the war years. The Women's Emergency Corps was a project with a significant national reach that ch practically changed the lives of women and girls left out of work by war. It taught them new skills, it harnessed their existing skills, it encouraged their creativity. Um, and because it was started by performers working at the top of their profession, it was an outward you know, outward looking confident organisation and the toy department, for example, you know, exhibited amongst well known makers, even after just six months of, of existence and was competing for sales successfully at a national level. Despite the unwillingness of established institutions and systems of government to fully support and recognise the contribution uh, made by the Women's Emergency Corps, it really was part of a network of women's organisations working at grassroots level to effect positive change on the lives of British subjects as well as on refugees from the war. The British Women's Hospital Fund also raised significant sums of money through applying many of the successful elements of the public facing propaganda of the constitutional suffrage campaign to its own projects and by utilising the Actresses Franchise League's existing networks within the theatrical profession and reacting quickly to changing circumstances, it was able to raise funds and move, if not always forward, at least sideways. The Star and Garter Home for Disabled Servicemen was one of the British Women's Hospital Fund's most successful ventures, and they raised three times the amount they initially wanted to make it happen. The committee were also kind, be kind. They supported the Scottish Women's Hospitals and the Lord Roberts Memorial Fund and set up the Nation's Fund for Nurses. So, in fact, the Actresses Franchise League continued as an active campaign group until 1958 through another war and a new wave of feminist activism. They are really an inspiring organisation. And I think looking back on this work over, the, uh, over this period, looking back at the photographs I've got of those archives, looking back at the painstaking notes, using the new facilities we have actually to access newspapers online, which I didn't have when I was doing my doctoral research, um, just shows that even though they may have been forgotten in the history books or erased from the history books or even considered too complicated to include as a story by some people, I think it's important that we look for that legacy ourselves and we, we know that we have strong shoulders to stand on. And as having the privilege of being researchers um, and uh, for me, um, women in this period, for example, during lockdown, I was able to join the Magic Circle um, because I'm a magician. This is an organisation that was founded uh, in the Edwardian period, but did not let women join as members until 1995. And I joined not only because I wanted to access some of the resources that were possible and some of the support, but also I sort of wanted to join because other women who were much, probably much more skilled than me were not able to join before. So to summarise the tentacles, I would say, be kind to yourself and to others, collaborate, reach out and share expertise, facilitate the participation of others. You can't move forward, move sideways, revisit your research and your thinking, reread some of the texts you first start with or relook at the things that inspire you, reassess those projects with different eyes trademark take ownership of your ideas and your work where possible think about how you can future proof your current work as much as possible with an eye to future funding criteria kef criteria all sorts of things that may come up in the future think about that now particularly if you're an ecr ask for help and encourage others to be elastic connect your academic and your human selves 
be flex, be as flexible and versatile as you are in real life. Try and inject some of that into your academic work if you're feeling stuck. Look for the gaps, find new hooks in your work and use them to reframe ideas. Think, zoom out and have a look at what's missing and see if you can fill that or if you can find somebody um, that you can fill that gap with and be useful. Use your privilege, use your networks, your contacts and your visibility, not only to raise the profile of what you're doing, but to raise the profile of the wider issues facing the industry uh, that you're part of or the organisations that you're part of, or to raise the visibility of people who maybe have underrepresented voices or don't have the visibility that you have, that we have as part of this organisation and as part of a network of uh, ECRs and academics in this wider community. It's a tricky time for all of us uh, work-wise, as well as all of us as humans. So if we can be as useful as possible, then we'll, we'll, um, we'll at least be doing something. So thank you very much. I'm gonna draw this to a close. I know we're gonna have a respondent and some questions. I'm going to leave you with one more helicopter moment. Um, this is me outside the, uh, the site of the offices of the Men's Political Union for Women's Enfranchisement. Again, just off the strand. Um, singing the first and last verses of Lawrence Houseman's poem, Woman This and Woman That. Thank you very much indeed. We went up to St Stephen's with petitions year by year. Get out, the politicians cried, we want no women here. MPs behind the railing stood and laughed to see the fun. And bold policemen knocked us down because we would not run. For it's woman this and woman that, and woman say your say. But it's what's the woman up to when she tries to show the way. When she tries to show the way, my friend, she tries to show the way. And the woman means to show it, that is why she's out to 